in 1976, a divorced 50-year-old Peggy Hodgson and her four kids moved into a government-supported council house in North London in the suburbs of Enfield. The family consisted of two girls, Janet, 11, and Margaret, 12, and the boys, Johnny, 10, and Billy, who was seven. But not long after moving into the home, the two girls, Janet and Margaret, got bored one night and had nothing to do. So they made up a homemade Ouija board, but only intended to play with it as a game. You want your fortune told? Now, here's how it works. Everybody puts one finger on this, uh, just lightly. Then, uh, somebody asks a question. We all concentrate on it, and the Ouija will answer it. Oh, come on, sir. It will. It's magic. Oh, by the way, if you ask a silly question, it won't answer. <laughs> Can I ask a question, Daddy? All right, Buck. Lightly. Are there any ghosts in this house? But it's believed to be the result of the supernatural phenomena that was to come. This entity, or so-called poltergeist, must have gotten some kind of permission to enter the home from the girls. It is believed that as many as seven inhuman spirits entered the home at that time. On August 30th, 1977, the phenomena really got going strong. Many unexplainable things began to happen to the Hodgson family. The whole family were getting ready to relax for the night. Peggy Hodgson was downstairs and the two girls, Janet and Margaret, were upstairs in their bedroom. They both were getting prepared for bed. Then all of a sudden, the girl's chester drawers started to shuffle, then move on its own, as if someone was pushing it that was unseen. The girls were freaked out, so Peggy, the mom, heard the commotion. Peggy ran into the children's bedroom and said, It's time to cut this crap out. Stop fighting, be quiet, and go to bed, or I'm going to separate you girls. This is when Peggy saw the chester drawer move. So Peggy went to move the drawers back against the wall, and once more, the chester drawers moved again. Peggy tried to push the drawers back again, but they would not move at all. I told her what was going on, and she see it for herself. She see the chester drawers moving, and when she tried to push it back, she couldn't. She realized then that something wasn't right. I think we was awake all that night, all of us, and there was bits and bobs going on the wall and strange little noises in the house. And no one was doing it. We couldn't make out what was going on. By the next day, my mum was exhausted. She was emotional, nearly a wreck, you know. The next morning, the whole family was so frightened that they got their coats on and went next door to the neighbor's house, Vic and Peggy Nottingham. Now, Vic was a big man and he listened to the Hoshchin story. He wanted to see if their stories were true. So Vic goes to the Hoshchin's house himself. I went in there and um, I couldn't make out these noises. I went up the stairs and there was um, knocking on the wall. There was a knocking in the bedroom. I passed into the next bedroom and this knocking followed me. I was beginning to get a little bit frightened. Just couldn't make out what it was. Now Vic was a builder, so he understood how homes were put together and even Vic couldn't make out where the bangs and the sounds were coming from, so they all decided to call the police. As the police arrived, they looked around, and the police constable, Carolyn Heaps, saw a chair slide three to four feet before the chair came to a total stop. It um, came off the floor, or nearly a half inch, I should say, and I saw it slide off to the right, about three and a half to four feet before it came to rest. Um, I checked to see whether or not it could possibly have slid along the floor. I placed a marble on the floor to see whether or not the marble would um, go in the same direction as the chair did, and it didn't. It didn't roll at all. Um, I checked for wires under the cushion of the chair, and I could find no explanation at all. After about an hour, the police said there's nothing that they can do. So Peggy told Vic that she didn't know what to do next. So she decided to call the Daily Mirror 
When the reporters got to the house, the bizarre commotions and the unexplained got really weird. Graham Morris, a photographer, and Douglas Bentz, a journalist, went to the house in Enfield. The news desk phone kept ringing with this man up in Enfield called Vic Nottingham. I think the crunch came when, when the person on the phone, uh, the other end, said, um, oh, well, we've all seen this, including the, the police. We uh, drove up there in my car, the office car. When we arrived, um, the mother was horrified. So the reporters and the two families, the Hoshtons and the Nottinghams, went next door to see what would happen in the Hoshtons' home to see if it would happen again now. So they waited, and they had a cup of tea, and nothing happened right away until the two reporters were getting ready to leave in the car. Then Vic ran out of the Hoshtons' home and told the reporters that it had started again. As Graham Morris and Douglas Bentz went back into the Hoshtons' home, things like Legos, books, and even marbles started to fly around the room. As everyone was screaming and during the chaos, Graham Morris started to take pictures of what was happening. Douglas Bentz reports by saying he couldn't tell where the Legos or marbles were coming from. Bentz said, that the marbles didn't come from the kids' hands at all, nor from Mrs. Hoshton. During the chaos, Graham Morris got hit in the forehead with a Lego brick. But the following day, Bentz and Morris had the photos developed, and none of the supernatural events showed up on film at all from the prior night. The two reporters were upset that they didn't get anything supernatural on film, but the two reporters become so concerned for the family that they contacted specialists from the Society of Psychical Research. The SPR was set up in 1882 to investigate the unknown and examine any paranormal actions or unexplained actions. The SPR has a wide scope of individuals from complete doubters to individuals who are 100% sure the paranormal exists. At this very time, in 1977, the SBR had a new member, Morris Gross. Morris Gross was an inventor and joined the SBR after his daughter passed away. As soon as the call come in about Enfield, Morris Gross jumped at the chance and headed to the Hoshtons' home. I thought this is very, very unlikely. Anyway, I kept my mind fairly clear on it. I went to that house, went in. As soon as I got in, I could see everybody was very disturbed. The interesting thing here was that the mother and the children had no, not a clue what a poltergeist was. So he said, well, look, you're not on your own, Mr. Gross. And he said, I'm, I'm going to make sure that you're not left on your own to feel frightened anymore. And she thanked him and she said, I'm sorry about it, Mr. Gross. I just don't know what to do. She was very desperate. <laughs> He was quickly convinced that there was something really going on in the Hodgson's home. Morris Gross quickly felt like this case was over his head, so he sought the help from Guy Lyon Playfair. Guy is a writer and a journalist with a background in paranormal research. Within two weeks after the first coming in contact with the Hodgson family, the two started camping out at the Hodgson's home and ended up staying at the Hoshtons' home for the next 14 months. Both Morris Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair were convinced that they were dealing with a real poltergeist case. A poltergeist is a ghost or other supernatural being supposedly responsible for physical disturbances such as loud noises and objects being thrown around. Also. Many parapsychologist researchers believe that the psychokinesis or ESP in younger teens can play a part in this so-called poltergeist activity. The Daily Mirror's coverage attracted the attention of the BBC radio who sent over a young reporter to the home in Enfield to investigate and see what was really going on. The BBC sent over Roz Morris, a broadcaster. Morris Gross and Roz Morris talked over the case. And the family went to sleep and we waited to see if anything would happen. Well, we've just heard a noise having come downstairs. We've just heard a noise upstairs. 
and the chair, which was standing by Janet's bed, appears to have moved. The chair's been thrown behind Pete. Well, I'm hoping I'm not getting uh, the microphone shaking in my hand, because that was rather an unnerving experience. Mm. I mean, we all know kids can fake being asleep, but it didn't look like that. It looked as though she had been asleep, um, and suddenly something had happened. The knocks and sounds continued to happen. The children spoke of seeing a black mass that manifest itself in their bedroom, and it terrorized them by showing itself to them. They all started sleeping in the same room together. Finally, the Hodgkins reached their breaking point because they reported experiencing weird noises and knocks every night. Say the knocking is on the wall over there. You go to listen to the knocking on the wall over there and suddenly it will come from that wall over there. And when you go to listen there, it comes from the ceiling. It was entire, it was always on the walls and it always, and it was really thumping rather than knocking. There was a lot of thumping. So both Morse Gross and Guy Playfair got really worried about the family. So they both decided to send the family on a vacation to just get away from the house. After a week, the Hodgkins returned to their infield home and the disturbances returned as well with a vengeance. So Janet and Margaret were sleeping in the same bed and felt the bed shaking and moving very violently. Everyone heard knocking and banging on the walls of the bedroom. Morris Gross took the chance to try to communicate with the poltergeist. Morris came in and, and he said, I wonder if it could answer me. I challenged this knocking. Knock one for no and two for yes. Are you a male spirit? One for no and two for yes. That's two. You are a male spirit. Are you having a game with me? Oh, right. Oh, as I ask the, as I ask the question, are you having a game with me? It threw, it threw the, the cardboard box and the pillow right at my face. Well, if I wanted proof, that was it. I mean, there was no better proof in the world of anything than that. In late November 1977, Janet started drawing really disturbing pictures. And all the while, her behavior and her attitude was really becoming concerning and would go into like epileptic fits. Janet had even attacked her mother and attempted to kill her with her bare hands. And on a number of times, almost succeeded. Morris had to physically restrain Janet to help calm her down. They called a doctor over on the 26th of November. The doctor had to sedate Janet with 10 milligrams of Valium just to calm her down. That didn't stop the poltergeist at all though. Somehow, Janet got out of bed and Janet was found asleep on top of the Chester drawers, sleeping on top of a radio. Even Janet was confused about how she got there. So we conducted a couple of interviews with the girls and in one of them I was asking them about uh, when the phenomena began and then suddenly, halfway through the interview, there was a loud knocking noise. I think it was three knocks. Um, I can't remember exactly when. In the atmosphere, in the context that we were filming, of course, everyone was quiet. There was nothing going on. And people would be aware of interruptions and noise. And, of course, everyone was immediately aware that something had, had gone on. And nobody in that room had caused it. I mean, I don't know whether it was caused by the family, with, with Janet as the main person um, causing it, um, or whether it was something else trying to get in. I have no idea. How does it feel to be haunted by a poltergeist? It's not haunted. Shut up. Why isn't it haunted? I don't know. Does I'll... it frighten you, the things that happen here? Oh, well, it did first, but now I've got more oh, used to it. And you learn to accept the things that happen. Now, Janet was captured more than once by the camera springing out of bed, seemingly against her will. Janet's asleep. And suddenly she's being dragged out of bed. She's dragged to the door. The door opens on its own. She goes through the door. And we, we heard the commotion upstairs. 
We rushed up the stairs and caught her coming down the stairs head first. On the 14th of November, two passer buyers by the house in Enfield had reports that were just so unbelievable. One passer buyer heard a commotion and looked up and seen Janet floating around her room as if she was levitating. He looked up, the curtains had been pulled across, he looked up and he saw Janet floating around the room in a horizontal position like this, followed by some books and toys. But at the same time, a lady across the road seen Janet lying flat and she was floating up and down in front of her bedroom window. Then a new twist. Morris Gross was sitting in the living room with the family and then all of a sudden he hears a dog bark. Come on, let me hear you say my name. Now that was the first time we heard the voice and since then we've been hearing it again and again. And what, what do you think these are? Are they people or are they just voices? Could be spirits, I don't know. It's a spirit. Janet reports that the creepy voice wasn't coming from her, but from behind her. Does, when you hear the voice and it comes out, where does it come from? Here, in your throat? No. Where do you feel it comes Back from? Back of the neck. Back of the neck. And so it must be as if it's somebody else speaking there when you hear yeah, it. Yeah, behind us. I wonder, do you think there's anyone there just now? Yeah, I do. Who's that? What? There was occasions when I'm sure thinking back that Morris would take my mouth up or fill my mouth with water. I got to take some water in her mouth, taped over her mouth, and it still spoke. And then I said, All right. And I took the tape off, and uh, she spat the water out. They're, they're certainly not very good ventriloquists. We have had tests on them to see whether they can ventriloquise. They can't. Um, to keep up this particular type of voice for any length of time without damage to the vocal cords is absolutely impossible. I mean, there must be some hoarseness attached to it. But don't forget, these children don't do this for a couple of minutes or so. They do it for lengths of periods up to three hours and without any hoarseness or sore throats whatsoever. But Morris Gross believed that the voice that was coming from Janet was an unhappy spirit named Bill that used to live in the same house as the Hushton. So Morris asked his son Richard Gross to ask and interrogate the poltergeist. Richard definitely believed that the voice coming from Janet was the voice of an older man and that Janet was not faking. Several months later, Morris Gross was contacted by Terry Wilkins. Terry's father was buried in a local cemetery. Terry's father, Bill, had lived in the Hodgkin's home before the family moved in. Morris Gross played the recordings to Terry. I want you to tell me whether you remember what happened to you when you died. I went blind. Then I had an emwich and I fell asleep and I died in a chair in a corner downstairs. Describes exactly how That's exactly what happened. He died in the chair, down in the living room. In the summer of 1978, Ed and Lorraine Warren was visiting England, and the case of the Enfield poltergeist was brought to their attention. So they visited the Hodgkin's home. Ed Warren is a self-proclaimed demonologist, and his wife, Lorraine Warren, is also a clairvoyant. The purpose for their visit was to try to help the family gather evidence of the phenomena occurring at the Hodgkin home. This evidence that Ed was hoping to gather could be used as proof if there is a need for an exorcism of the premises. Ed Warren claims to have spent a week in Enfield and thoroughly interviewing the family separately and then together. Ed even witnessed the supernatural phenomena happening all around the home. He was able to see how the family was affected. Ed said the family was so oppressed 
by this entity, and he believed that Janet was possessed by an inhuman entity. These are some of the recordings that Ed Warren recorded. Friends, you know who I am? Ed. Ed, that's right, Fred. Now, Fred, do you like to frighten these people? Do you like to frighten the people here? Uh, I don't think so either. How do you think that they could get rid of all the things that are happening here? Hello, Dusty. Kill the ghosties. Huh? Kill the ghosties. Kill the ghosties. Tommy? Yeah. Fred, you know what this is? Cross. 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 Yeah. Were you, uh, were you a Christian? No. What were you? I was a... A soldier. What? Soldier. A soldier. Yeah. Why aren't soldiers Christians? Yeah. Yeah. Ed was convinced that the family was under some kind of supernatural oppression, but Ed Warren wasn't able to help rid the family of the entity because they believed that this was some kind of evil demonic activity and it would require the assistance of a Catholic priest to come and perform a cleansing. So Ed told Peggy that she should call the Catholic priest to come to her house to perform a cleansing, and Peggy did. After the cleansing, the supernatural thing slowed down to almost a stop. Not long after all this, Peggy, with the help of Morris Gross and Guy Playfair, admitted Janet into Maudsley Hospital. The doctor did all kinds of testing, and the tests all came back with no problems. After about two months, of Janet being in the hospital, Janet was allowed to return home, and it seemed as if all the supernatural events died out completely. Like all poltergeist cases, they eventually start to diminish. And uh, I personally, and this is my own opinion, is that they start to diminish because the stress starts to reduce. Even though they died down and they stopped, I, I always felt there's always something there. I don't know about now, but while mum was there, there was always something there. Peggy Hodgson continued to live in the home until her death in 2003. Janet and Margaret have gone on to live normal lives, or as normal as you can live after all of this, after all the years that have passed since this case has ended. No one has changed their accounts of what had happened through the Hodgson family. I know, from my own experiences, it was real, and it did happen. Even some were offered money by the press to change their stories, but their stories remained the same. <laughs>